Hey, my name is Dennis. I am the CEO and founder of Launch Brightly. But really, I'm an entrepreneur who made five some odd products over the last 27 years. We're all getting older. And if you're a founder, you are really the primary support individual. You put some product into market, you'll be very fragile to begin with in that prototype, you'll change into some MVP, you'll change into some first version with a little bit of success, you'll grow into some second version, real users, and each one of those changes will see dramatic changes. So that first 10 articles turn into 100 articles, turn into hundreds of articles in your knowledge base. And all of those articles will have a host of product screenshots that looked like one thing on Monday, a different thing on Friday, and a dramatic change over that first uh, number of years. So I have an intimate relationship with product screenshots, because I've certainly been doing Command Alt 4 on my PC for the last two decades and more. Now. I would love to underline a few items why I think you should also care. And you can say I'm slightly uh, biased, but it's certainly a particular pain I've had. So I'll be very confused almost if there's not other people out there who look like me. But let's jump into it. So the first thing, and I would assume you would immediately agree is that the knowledge base in and of itself is super important. I think we figured that out uh, many moons ago, but we can uh, add a few stats to that. And again, don't take these two as conclusive stats. You can find your own and there's plenty of others uh, out there. But if you build any product, there's certainly no version of that for where you don't have a knowledge base. As in, I just can't compute a setting for where one would believe the product is so good that I don't need a knowledge base. That's some sort of utopia. So here's uh, Sendesk, and surely they're biased, like we all are. But almost all, 91% of customers, said they would use that knowledge base if it was made available. And then again, we all know this, Go no further than you having some trouble on some B2C tool that you used yesterday. I'll go to Google, I'll search for it, and I just expect, first of all, that the help center and knowledge base, uh, etc., are well indexed, and I can find it, and they're at the top of the results, and when I click into an article, it'll help me solve my issue. Just an expectation. Again, here's Forrester, who suggests, on the other hand, given a list of opportunities, if you stack rank them, the knowledge base is actually on top. As in, I even feel that I actually rather, on my own volition, read a really good article, as in a solid piece of documentation, versus that of having to email somebody at some generic email, hoping for a good response time, which might or might not be the case, or chat with somebody who might or might not fully understand what it is I'm trying to solve, which I feel is kind of very unique to me. If I could, I'd just rather jump into some good documentation. And again, don't take these two as uh, conclusive. Go find your own. And I don't think this is really a dramatic statement. So now that we know that this is something we should and must put in place, what I like on top of that is it's not just that set of external constituents that we're doing it for, there's that whole set of internal set of constituents and not just the internal knowledge base. By the way, and as a side note, I've always been a fan of collapsing those two, thing in, two things into one, not as two separate things where, hey, we run help.company.com on Sendesk, we run our internal knowledge base on Guru and the internal one will be super kind of intimate. Keeping those two things up to date, having 
that many secrets which you can't tell in public? Side note, that's not what we're here to talk about today. What I do like though, is that having it, and having it in good order, just makes for happier agents, by whatever definition of agents we might all have. And not only that, they're just more productive. And again, I think happiness and productivity might just go hand in hand. Now, if we know that there's a knowledge base, probably forever growing and in some uh, capacity, I think you can make a statement that product screenshots are powerful. And why? Well, the first part, and this is probably not even opinion anymore, but real research uh, and enough papers that all of us can kind of pick up for where visual communication are just easier to consume. And don't necessarily go for my bullets here, go find your uh, own papers, but even kind of common sense, right? As in, I'm trying to pick up some course in college uh, at uh, uni, and if there was no visuals in that particular textbook, I'm not so sure I would have uh, been able to kind of uh, complete that particular course. I rely on that in many places to pick up new material. So just common sense, my own personal kind of experience, but then backed up by a set of papers. We can just transmit more information quicker to the individual through imagery. When I say imagery, for most software products that we're trying to support and provide good documentation for, that tends to be, at least in large part, product screenshots. As in, hey, somebody can't figure out how to set up two-factor authentication, which is a little bit kind of complex inside our app, well, provide some imagery for what that looks like and what steps to take is probably the best way to do it. Now, on that, what I like on top of just the pure fact that there's more bandwidth on imagery versus words, and again, I don't think there's a words versus imagery discussion to be had for where I need good product imagery along with good wording around it. It's not either or, it's just one for where I can't really escape the product imagery. But I do also like that I can bond, if that's the right word, with my users in a much stronger way using imagery in ways I can't really do in the same way just using words. For that alone, because really in the end, if I were to whisper anything, what I want are not just users, I want advocates. I want people to kind of fall in love with what we have and be so excited and feel so well educated that they're confident enough to tell other people on how to use this application. And that engagement, that's something which you can dial up as you use these product visuals. That emotional kind of reaction. Remember, people many times arrive a little bit frustrated. It's not like we are picking them up on their best day. We're picking them up in a moment for where they're not ecstatic, to put it uh, politely. The actual comprehension of the material the ultimate goal is not just one for where I want you to be able to see you're in the right place, consume my uh, material, solve your issue, and be on your way. Absolutely, I want that to happen. But in the best case scenario, what I also want is for you to learn something so that in three weeks, two months, seven months, you now know how to use this particular feature in our application and have no need to go into the documentation. You just know how to do it. You're smarter. That's kind of, at least for me, the ultimate goal. And as Dr. Linnell said, and I can share the paper here, which I really like, even just to say, uh, 
good argument for why I'm investing all this time and energy into my own product visuals is that if I could move from that kind of short-term memory into long-term memory on what I kind of said before, which is that I don't just want you to go through the motions of step one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, solve issue, be on your way and be good with that. No, I want you to remember this as in today I picked up some new information and I stored it long-term memory, ultimate goal that you can increase in a very different way using product imagery. Plenty of papers. Don't have to look at this one. We can pick up a dozen or so that just confirm that my ability to remember anything for where there was a image attached to it is much higher, like dramatically higher, not one of those things that can really be debated anymore, which is nice because we have the opportunity. It's not like we are short on imagery. We might be short on kind of resources and time and energy and money to kind of do it, but we're certainly not short of that well of imagery which we can extract from, which many times is our, our product. So sit, it sits there, we can take it if we want to. Now, if you do this, and I strongly recommend that you dial up the amount of product visuals that you use in your uh, documentation. And yes, I know I'm a fan, but I do think by whatever no set of metrics or even KPIs that you might use to measure the success of your knowledge base, you can improve almost all of them, if not all of them, by applying extra attention to this. I'll show you some silly ones. You call them naive and that's fine. Uh, but really just as examples, right? You'll have, have your own and uh, they'll be more sophisticated and super happy to kind of discuss interesting kind of uh, metrics we can use to determine the success of our knowledge base and whether we're kind of driving in the right direction because if we don't measure it, how do I know whether my help center and uh, my associated knowledge base is not getting worse over time? I said, that increase in tickets, why is that? Is that uh, because product didn't do a good job or engineering didn't do a good job or DevOps didn't provide me a stable platform or is it just that there's something in what I've crafted on my end that it isn't kind of holding up anymore. There's some rot attached to it. The first metric could be the duration per session. I certainly want people to consume the material in full. That's why I crafted it. And I think you should consume it in full to succeed. If not, well, that is on me to kind of compress it as, and I don't want you to sit here and read my uh, novel. I want you to consume the most compressed version of what you need to consume to learn what I need you to learn. If you have product visuals, uh, and it might sound counterintuitive where, hmm, Dennis, I think you just alluded to earlier that I might be able to remove some of my wording, replace that with uh, imagery, why would that have people spend more time? Well, many times the duration comes not from consuming what's there, but by them choosing to scan the wall of text or the material provided, perhaps even decide that I'm not in the right place or decide this is uh, too much for me to consume right now to figure this out. I might just surrender and many other kind of uh, human reasons for what, for not going to engage with that material. With the product imagery, what we see is that, ah, let me lean in. Let me actually try to kind of see what is going on here. I certainly know I'm in the right place. I can see I'm in the right place. The product imagery is what I'm looking at in the application itself. I'll start at the top and go through it. And sure, Average duration will suffer from bounces and other things, but they all fall into the fact that you should be able to dial this up. And then both of these, by the way, side note, if you're an uh, analyst, they're both a little tricky to kind of track, right? As in a bounce rate is not always uh, bad if you take the most naive interpretation of a bounce rate, which is that I did a search on Google, I found one of uh, your articles, I clicked into it, I might even have consumed it in full, long duration to the end, and then I just skip it. Like that could be a technical bounce, but anybody doing a little bit more sophisticated version of a bounce will have that not fall into that. So we can do some uh, segmentation on 
true bouncers and uh, successful bouncers. But what you want is certainly uh, for good matches. Just as another quick comment, uh, there's plenty of searches where they search not for the right thing, end up not on the right article, and they should bounce. I said, hey, on that question, you shouldn't be on this article. I want you to kind of bounce and jump away. Any time you spend here will be a waste of time or kind of setting, kind of sending you in the wrong direction. So any good match, like this is the right question, this is the right uh, page, you should not bounce. I said, I, we're good. Like, this is the date we're supposed to have. So do not bounce. This through good product visuals on these pages. And again, this is the internet, right? Uh, anybody gets a few seconds for where on that first scan. If I can't immediately confirm that I'm in the right place, some will just choose to say, nah, forget it. Uh, I'll jump to the next one in my list. So we want, and again, that product visual can help us have them immediately attached to, I am in the right place. Now we'll see whether the material provided to me is good enough for me to consume it in full, but I'm certainly confident I'm in the right place. Other metrics can also improve, some of them kind of dramatically. So your search performance, and again, uh, we would all want to own the first set of results for questions about us, our product. We certainly don't want other people or allow other people to be given the opportunity to answer our own questions. I want to have control of that and plenty of little kind of competitor hacks that we all kind of probably kind of work with or certainly our marketing and acquisition teams have been working with. But I want to own that by including the imagery, having good proper titles, alt tags, text around it will allow you not only to kind of improve your ranking, on these particular types of questions, move further up the rankings and increase the likelihood of you being that uh, dominant uh, first click, but also see yourself arrive in image search and in some of the uh, top snippets and so on and so forth. So for that alone, forget anything else which I've said, this might just be an initiative where we want to dial up some of our efforts. Let's say, uh, resource uh, here which you could check out that uh, will have some of the same kind of uh, you know, what you might call silly kind of metrics but also some more mature ones uh, happy to kind of share the link uh, just shoot me an email and I can send it over or pause uh, the video if you can if this is being shared later now there's some different types of product screenshots that we can take that's an infinite amount of product screenshots. Well, we can probably put them into two buckets. There's the full page screenshot, perhaps uh, in a couple of incarnations here. That's the one for where you provide as much context as you can. And when I say full page, think large, right? What I can see on my laptop screen or something like that. And I write in my text, what I think you should read from this. Then there's the other version where I want to kind of apply some focus on some area and I annotate it with some rectangles, circles, arrows, and so on and so forth. Then there's the other version where I need product elements, smaller extracts, many of them, and I can speak specifically to that and have it included as part of the flow of how I read the text. And I'm not suggesting uh, one is necessarily better or worse uh, than the other, but these are two distinct types of ways that we learn new material. And we should be aware of that as we go apply one tactic uh, over another. And I just want to have that in mind because it's not just about injecting imagery uh, willy-nilly uh, into my text I should have in mind as in what I'm trying to achieve here and make sure that the text around the imagery supports that uh, case. And again, they're not two, this is a Venn diagram, they'll kind of blend into each other for where some of the product element screenshots will be bigger, some of the full page ones can be a little bit more compressed. Now, uh, this might sound dramatic uh, a little bit, but including bad visuals might just be worse than not including any imagery at all. But why is that? As in Dennis, having something must count for some value. Well, 
we make the assumption here that uh, I have some value on a text-only version of my documentation. I add some product visuals. I can increase uh, that value by whatever measure. But that suggests that the value of the image can never be below zero. But a wrong visual, or bad in any number of ways, compression, pixelated, this and that, perhaps it could have a negative value. Perhaps it could actually confuse the individual for where, well, those screenshots you took of, say, that uh, two-factor authentication that they're trying to learn about are not up to date anymore. Damn. Now they arrive confused, a little bit kind of skeptical, and now I'm not making it any easier for them. That might just be a negative value. And we should have that in mind, that it comes at a cost. And there's the perhaps more kind of research part of it, which is that it's just harder to learn on a poor visual or even on a wrong visual. And I might even kind of confuse them and what should have been a flow when I read and consume this uh, content is not a flow anymore because I have that moment of, that can't be right. And then, then I start to kind of scan or jump around and now I'm kind of sabotaging my own efforts. And again, uh, you might just immediately say, Dennis, I can't believe or sign up for, or I'll push back that a little bit pixelated, low resolution, over compressed, I pick JPEG over PNG, and what's even the difference? And ah, yeah, badly resized, a little bit kind of off. It all doesn't matter. P perhaps I might push back then, uh, which is that you are now painting a picture of the overall quality of you, your product, your organization. And that lack of detail or lack of quality, many will immediately translate that into the idea, at least, that the tool is not any good, that the very app they signed up for and or are using is probably also of poor quality. That's not the emotion that we want to attach. So once we decide to invest into product visuals, we must also attach ourselves to the idea they should be of high quality. People are skeptical. Let's not make them any more skeptical here. This, when you look at it, just looks like a silly, blurry image. <laughs> Side note, like four times when I went through this presentation, each time I almost opened up the comment section and said, hey, I should replace this image with a better one until I figure out that's the whole point of this slide, that, ah, yes, everybody can kind of read this. Just go a little closer to the screen. You can figure out that, uh, uh, it's this uh, age of first transaction. I can read that. But you're still sending a message. And of course, there's other messages. And you might again say, ah, Dennis, it's just a drop down. It says 2016. People know we're in 2023. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, there's uh, a whole set of applications for where you know dates matter, but just uh, leave that out of this uh, discussion. Once I look at this, I now have to kind of assemble the energy and trust to believe that it's just the product screenshot, which is out of date and not the text, and that everything which I read now, I can trust. But can I? And why would I even allow for that moment of doubt? where they are now uh, hesitant to believe what they read and consume because it's just a little bit out of date. That's obviously the other more kind of dramatic version of out of date, which is that the product, which, by the way, changes all the time now. It was an age, and I'm old enough to remember that for where we would launch something every quarter, every half year, once a year we'll have a major version kind of coming out. Now, even the most junior engineer in some SaaS product will push something to production this afternoon because we can. And that kind of velocity will very quickly see reality, aka your product, and the product visuals you have move apart and become an ever bigger delta to the point for where we can talk about image rot. And sometimes, sure, it'll be little things like, yeah, uh, this feature is in the top right, 
is not even in the top right in the actual kind of documentation, in my opinion. Then over time, it becomes actually more in the uh, top left. Yeah, yeah, they'll figure that out. Yes, but how many things needs to be a little bit off before the whole thing is off? And we might not care about this one thing, is when one thing turns into 10 things that turns into 100 things, that turns into something that is now truly rotten. It actually got renamed. It's not even placed here. It's elsewhere. And then we're sabotaging ourselves. But keeping them truly up to date is not easy. It's hard, right? Like hard. Because all of the success we've had on the engineering side and all of that kind of velocity that we've seen arrive with CI and CD and push to production 17 times a day with all sorts of kind of secure testing attached to it. Good on them. Good on all of us. I love it. It just makes it hard, like hard to keep these up to date. Now, I think even with that fact, there's no version where we do not do a knowledge base. That I think we just all agree on. I think there is no version really in the near future where we can surrender on the idea of not adding product visuals. We must. If we do add these visuals, which we know are sticky, we'll have people easily confirm they're in the right place, make them better at learning the very material, have them stored in the long-term memory so they don't have to come back later in three months, can consume at a higher bandwidth more information at a shorter period of time. We must just uh, assemble the courage to kind of do these product visuals, even if it's hard. Like, who wouldn't want their users to be able to better comprehend what I'm trying to kind of tell them right now at this moment? Here are a few automation hacks and some manual kind of processes. On the processes side, I can't tell you anything which you don't already know or do. We all do the same thing, right? We'll put some weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual type of audits in place to kind of make sure that uh, what we have is all good and proper. We might even do some filtering and segmentation on the support articles we have in our documentation to make sure that uh, where we spend our time is perhaps on the most viewed ones or the most important ones by whatever measure so that if I make a change, I'm uh, spending my time and energy and money uh, well. I might even have some checklists on new features that are being launched that I did together with uh, product and product marketing folks. And we have this kind of internal Slack channel. I see new things being released ahead of time. I get access to staging. I can do some of my screenshots of learning before it's being launched. Hey, they're all good processes. We should all kind of share them with each other and make sure that we kind of dial them up. I do think there's a ceiling to that though, as in, at some point, there's only so much I can extract from my Notion and Trello boards and Google Docs and what have you. Like, this is it. Like, this is as good as it gets. Like, you, you don't get that little notification on, hey, Junior so-and-so changed these three buttons on this sidebar or on this modal or something else. Nah, he just did it. And it's suddenly better. He should do it. The UX is just a little bit more tuned now. He didn't share it though. Your documentation is now slightly out of date. Damn, he even changed some of the wording. It's not called delete, it's called archive now because hey, we now allow people to kind of look at what they've archived. <sighs> well, here we are. But good processes. And your knowledge-based software will have plenty of kind of features to kind of help you do some of this, or your BI software will allow you to do some analysis to kind of help you kind of optimize these processes. I do think though it's inevitable that at some point in the not too distant future, we will arrive in a automated setting. As in, I just can't create a scenario for where the future is me going in even on some small, medium-sized product, take in the hundreds, many times in the thousands of product screenshots, 
By the way, we are only doing desktop light mode, couldn't even assemble the time and energy to do it in the dark mode, which we actually invested money into engineering or into the German version or the Spanish version or the responsive kind of mobile version. Damn, a thousand turned into kind of 10,000 very quickly. So just, it's not a human task. It just doesn't feel like a human task. Now, the automation hacks, a couple ideas at least. Uh, it sounds like a hack. I don't think it's a straight hack, but your engineering team today will have some QA software in place to, or likely to have some QA software in place to test the UI. And as they test that UI, the software are many times able to take a screenshot right there. It was really to kind of test it, but they can actually give you a set of snapshots that might allow you quick access to a mini library of screenshots you didn't even didn't even know you could get access to. That's certainly worthy of a little internal kind of discussion, in my opinion. Uh, you could, which is more ambitious, but on a large tool, might be a worthy endeavor, write some custom scripts to take screenshots. Really, what you do manually, right? Command, Shift, 4, take a screenshot, uh, after you've done a little bit of inspect elements to delete some things and take some actions, it lands on your desktop, you clean up a little bit, you add some annotations. That's a process. You can kind of program against that. Uh, there's actually some folks here, uh, again, I can share the link if you email me, or you can just take it from here, who wrote a good little post on how they did it for their documentation, not just as a... Uh, idea, but as in, hey, we put it in production, so we, uh, on any change to the product, take a new set of screenshots. So that's it. That's my uh, short story. And again, uh, I might put way more emphasis on product screenshots. And you might say, yeah, I, I kind of agree. They're not that important, Dennis. I do think they are. And you should uh, kind of push back here and we'll have a little uh, healthy uh, debate uh, back and forth. Uh, I'll be remiss if I didn't say that me and five of my propeller head friends have been sitting in a basement for the last seven months trying to make a tool to automate this process. Not selling anything. We're not even at a V1 uh, just yet. Love to kind of hear from you. So do feel free to kind of email me at dennis at launchbrightly.com and uh, give me a story about where you're at, uh, any kind of unique uh, requests uh, that you have, be super kind of interested. Then again, thank you very much for, for listening. It's been fun. Cheers. All right, this is gonna be another quick one because we only have about a minute or two. And basically the question that I think was, you know, the highest engaged question here was, what do you think is the right ratio like the number of images to text, because some people are saying that like, you know, a high number of screenshots can maybe disrupt the flow. And we talked about scannability earlier with Steven. Yes. And like, but sometimes you need that kind of step-by-step -step interaction. Thoughts, please. Yeah. Hello, Dennis, welcome. We're talking about ratios. Yeah, 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 I heard. I'm still working my video, sorry about that. All good, please, opinions. Yeah. I think we've actually done like a little bit of work and kind of scanning some kind of that, those external like kind of customer facing um, help centers and kind of like done some benchmarking um, on that type of thing. And we generally see like kind of like an average ratio is kind of like three plus screenshots um, per okay. like help article. Um, I think one of the things that we kind of like keep in mind on that ratio is like, I think Caitlin Davey did a great talk at the kind of last at the Portland events. Um, on Mayer's kind of like multimedia learning principles and kind of two of those that we kind of take away when we kind of see in those screenshots uh, styles that Dennis had um, in the presentation there is kind of like people learn best from like words and text and mm -hmm. people learn best from when like the exact information is pointed out to them, right? So it's probably less about the exact ratio or the exact number of screenshots that actually kind of live within that kind of article or that that documentation, but applying those principles, right? It's like, when's the right time to kind of like insert that information, right? It's like, what's the right combination of text and imagery? And then also kind of is that imagery like actually helping like to point out exactly to people what they should be focused on and what the documentation is trying to exactly tell them. Yeah, of course. And then do you have anything to add, Dennis, before we 
end our Q&A so quick. Ah, uh, Joss, don't need my commentary. That's good. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we had so many other questions about, you know, GIFs and moving images, things like that. Where can people find you so that they can get their questions answered about screenshots? Yeah, John. I read a paper not long ago that suddenly suggested that GIFs and similar animated settings allowed for perhaps a quicker learning in the moment but didn't allow people to retain the information as long as static images. So I think it depends a little bit on what your objective uh, might be. And if you're one for why you're really keen and eager to create a set of advocates that truly understand and learn your product so that in three months, they can not only figure it out themselves, they can tell somebody else. Static images, at least at this very moment, might seem to be superior. But you might be at a B2C like product setting for where we get 100,000 tickets and I'll do whatever to escape the next tickets and their animations uh, might just be uh, worthy. But I don't think it's an either or. I think it really depends on the type of question. And many times the poor man's GIF are three screenshots for where you show the process, right? Uh, so you can always go there. Perfect. All right. So unfortunately we have to cut this off, but thank you so much to both of you. Really engaging talk.